This is a 67-year-old gentleman who injured his right shoulder when he fell about six weeks ago. You can see that he has very little uh, function at this point and is in significant pain, particularly at night. We put an arthroscope in the area with the rotator cuff runs called the subcrimal space, and we were removing the inflammatory tissue as well as the degenerative tissue that you can see evidenced by the large amount of fraying. All of this tissue is abnormal. We've used a electrocautery device to also assist us in the removal of this abnormal tissue. It's imperative that we remove any scar tissue and bursal remnants so that we get a clear picture of what is healthy cuff tissue and what is not. We're now looking from the side view. The rotator cuff is this white band of tissue in the center of the screen. To the left is the back part of the shoulder where we've just inserted the shaver. The front is to the right. The flimsy tissue that we're removing is the bursal tissue. As you can see, in some areas it becomes quite thickened and it can sometimes masquerade actually as the rotator cuff. So it's very important that this is removed. If it's inadvertently confused with the rotator cuff, the repair will fail. So the cuff is this large segment of tissue that we are grasping at this point. This is showing where it belongs. As you can see, when it is left without tension, it tends to retract away, and that is why rotator cuff tears cannot possibly heal on their own and require surgical intervention to do so. Commonly associated with a rotator cuff tear is a so-called bone spur. The front part of the acromion bone frequently has a projection on its undersurface that limits the space where the rotator cuff can run. By removing this spur, we help protect our repair, and it also is associated with improved pain scores. So this burr is being placed from the back towards the front and is shaving the undersurface of this spur. Ideally, the undersurface of this bone is smooth and flat. This is done in a fluid medium, so it looks like we're working underwater. There's a pump that keeps the tissue from collapsing in on our viewing screen. The tissue does become waterlogged with time and we do have to make an effort to clean it out from time to time so we can visualize things well. We've now changed our viewing and working sides. We're looking from the back, working from the side. and We want the inner surface of the acromion bone to be smooth and flat in two planes. As we continue to work here, we're slowly removing bone. We don't want to remove too much bone. And here you can see the finished product of the acromioplasty, nice and smooth and flat. We're now preparing the footprint of the rotator cuff. When the rotator cuff fails, it typically comes off the bone but leaves some tissue behind. Since it's the bone that heals to the tendon and not the other way around, it's important that we have the bone completely exposed so that it can reattach itself to the rotator cuff tendon. As you can appreciate, the, the tear is quite large here. The frayed material to the right is the biceps tendon, which is also quite abnormal and will be dealt with in subsequent viewing portions of this video. The white part just to the right of the device is the joint surface of the ball, part of the ball and socket. So we can see almost the entire ball here. There's no tissue covering it whatsoever. That's it, completely abnormal. The rotator cuff should completely cover that. Now an important part of this repair is to make sure that the cuff is repaired without undue tension. This is an L-shaped tear. So we will grasp varying parts of the cuff to determine which area has the best excursion. If the cuff is repaired under tension, the risk of it failing is much higher. We're now inserting an anchor. It has a corkscrew that is buried in the bone and has sutures passing through it. The biceps tendon in this individual is markedly abnormal and will contribute to postoperative pain unless it's dealt with appropriately. 
we're going to perform a tenodesis, which essentially transplants the attachment of the biceps tendon outside of the joint adjacent to the rotator cuff. This tissue normally glides back and forth and would become so abnormal it can be a source of pain. We're using a suture passer here to pass the a suture through the biceps tendon itself. There are two sutures per suture anchor and both sutures will be passed. Here we see both sutures having been passed. We're now tying the sutures. We're using a device called a six finger knot tire. It helps hold the knot in place while we have additional throws placed to it. There we see our self-locking sliding knot that is then going to be held in position while tension is being applied to one of the limbs, which helps tighten it down. It also helps hold it in place so when we have additional loops of suture placed, the knot itself is less likely to slip. Now we've just cut the suture we've tied. Because we've transplanted the tendon, we need to remove the part that now attaches inside of the joint itself. We see how markedly abnormal this tissue is. Here we've removed it back to its base. Now we continue to prepare the area where the rotator cuff attaches. His entire cuff is off, which explains his poor function. Again, because the bone heals to the tendon, not vice versa, it's important that we get a completely bare area of bone. Here we've used our suture passer to pass a side-to-side -side suture through the L-shaped portion of the cuff. And we can see here that it's going to secure the two segments of the cuff together, thereby making this somewhat more complex tear into a more simple pattern. The suture has been tied using the aforementioned technique and have now been cut. Replacing anchors right next to the articular surface. This is where the anatomic footprint of the rotator cuff is. We're going to use a double row repair, which biomechanically has the most stability. The suture passer is passed through all areas of the damaged cuff. This uh, loop of blue material suture is retrieved through a cannula. A limb of suture is retrieved through the same cannula. The suture is passed in the loop outside of the body and then is shoveled through the rotator cuff. There we see the suture that has been passed. We're going to pass another suture limb here. So now we've grasped another part of the cuff that is torn. This is a fairly complicated, complex tear. And all the sutures are passed at first, so there has to be a lot of planning. The, we'll grasp the cuff several times, make sure that we like where it's going, pass our sutures through it. Again, we want to make sure there's going to be minimal tension so that the, the sutures don't either cut through the rotator cuff itself or break, which is less common. One of the advantages of arthroscopic visualization is we see much better than it can be done in an open fashion and it is clearly superior for visualizing how the cuff mechanics work, how it's supposed to be repaired. Here we're grasping the um, sutures that we've passed. 
Now again, grabbing the edge of the cuff, determine it, its excursion. We can also get a good feel for how much tension is on it. We use a needle to help localize where we want our anchors to go. We do this through the skin, of course, grasping the rotator cuff tissue. We've passed two sutures. We see the two sutures that we've passed. Similar technique that we showed you earlier, where the suture passer goes through the cuff itself. A shuttle stitch coupled with one limb of the suture at a time. Then it's retrieved through the cuff itself. Here we see all four limbs passed. We're going to place a second anchor next to the articular margin adjacent to where the biceps tendon would normally run. The laser lines show the appropriate depth of insertion. The idea in repairing the rotator cuff is to create a mechanical situation where the cuff can heal but also restores the normal anatomy and footprint to the rotator cuff tendon. This is a spike that we use to create several passageways into the marrow cavity. The bone itself, itself does not bleed very well, and it's a slowly metabolizing structure. Those who've had the misfortune of breaking a bone know it takes six weeks or longer for bone to heal. Uh, by allowing the marrow contents to come into this area, we allow stem cells and other healing cells to help speed the rate and improve the quality of healing. Again, a, another anchor place. This is the lateral row anchor. This is placed on the outer side of the footprint. We see our previously placed sutures. Now those sutures have been passed. And here we have our second lateral row anchor. At this point it can be a fairly confusing jumble of multiple sutures passing through the cuff. Now here we're going to tie the sutures. We start on the outer edge first. We'll grasp two limbs of, the each, suture, of each suture. They all sort of start to look alike, so it's important that we grab the uh, appropriate one. These sutures are then tied outside of the body using a self-locking sliding knot that we've just slid into place. Again, the six-finger knot tire will help secure it fully and then hold it in place while a second uh, suture limb is tied and passed to help lock it in place. We'll tie a series of arthroscopic square knots to help augment this and then we, tie, we cut the uh, suture. Now here we see the finished result. No longer do you see the exposed bone or the humeral head. You see a sea of soft tissue with a few sutures remaining. We can see where we've removed our bone spur here. Plenty of room for the rotator cuff to run. It looks like it's smooth and flat. Now if we look inside of the shoulder itself, we're looking at the ball part of the ball and socket and here we confirm that the rotator cuff has been repaired perfectly to its normal footprint. Here we see our patient several months later, no pain and a dramatic improvement in shoulder function.